70 years after the birth of Christ, the Romans suppressed the Jewish nation. With their temple in Jerusalem destroyed, the Jews became a race of wanderers. Their fate, it seemed, was always to suffer persecution, persecution which in the 20th century has been more terrible than ever before. But they survived through the strength of their religious hope, the hope that one day their nation would be reborn. In 1948, this hope was realized. A new state, Israel, came into being. Its leader was David Ben-Gurion. The creation of the State of Israel has been one of the foremost dramas of the 20th century. In 1958, when Israel celebrated her first 10 years of independence, modern Zionism was not yet 100 years old. Its pioneers were still alive. Men like Ben Zvi, Israel's president, and Ben Gurion had first come to Palestine when the country was ruled by the Turks. Ben Gurion had given his whole life to this cause. Everything else took second place to it, including his marriage. The cause became more real in 1917 when Lord Balfour, Britain's foreign secretary, issued a famous declaration favoring the establishment of a Jewish national home in Palestine. Taking over responsibility for Palestine from Turkey, Britain allowed stepped up Jewish immigration, mostly from Russia and Eastern Europe but it was not supposed to be at the expense of the Arabs. And the Arabs soon demonstrated their objections. Despite Arab hostility, Ben-Gurion took the lead in urging Jews to settle the land. Perhaps the most striking characteristic about Ben-Gurion, from his earliest days to his days as prime minister, was this almost frightening, single-minded determination towards one goal which was the achievement, the creation of the state of Israel, an independent Jewish state. All his choices, all the strategy and tactics he worked out over the years were designed with that in mind. And at the end, of course, it was World War II and the Holocaust that made it all possible. Einmal wird unsere Geduld zu Ende sein und dann wird den Juden das breche Lügenmaul gestoppt werden. In the 1930s, Nazi Jew baiting, fanned by Goebbels' propaganda, produced a new flood of Jews seeking to enter Palestine from Germany. Britain, as the ruling power, wanted the numbers controlled, but curbs of any kind were anathema to Ben Gurion, and in 1935 he won out over Weizmann, who trusted in British friendship. Ben Gurion was a student of power. He set out to acquire political power consciously from the day he arrived in Palestine. As war descended, the Jews entered the darkest period of their history. In Berlin, as the Nazi policy of extermination got underway, the Arab Mufti of Jerusalem became Hitler's ally. For her part, Britain also cultivated the friendship of Arab powers, whose territories were of great strategic importance. The price was even stricter control over Jewish immigration to Palestine.
But the war also gave the Jews of Palestine an opportunity. Over 20,000 of them had joined the British army. Eventually, Britain allowed a Jewish brigade to be formed, which from its location in Italy, became a means for the secret shipment of arms and immigrants to the coast of Palestine. These moves followed the most momentous decision taken by international Zionism since its foundation. In 1942, when the battle in North Africa was at its height, Ben-Gurion won acceptance for his visionary program, unlimited immigration and the creation of a Jewish state in Palestine. It was a program which could only lead to confrontation with Britain. In Palestine, several secret armies came into being, representing the different political groups within the Zionist movement. One of Ben-Gurion's hardest tasks as leader of the New Israel would be to bring these competing units under a unified command. When the war was over, Ben-Gurion's program forced the British into the unenviable role of having to intercept illegal immigrant ships and forcibly return their human cargo to camps in Cyprus. Nazi atrocities were fresh in everyone's minds, and here it seemed were the same pitiable scenes being played out before the eyes of the world. He was a man who knew how to capitalize on events and how to turn them to his own advantage how to exploit the British limit on immigration to Palestine after the war, and marshal public opinion. This was a skilled, clever, determined, thoughtful politician manipulating power. Despite the strong objections of Weizmann and others in the International Zionist Organization, Ben-Gurion was relentless in his policy of active resistance to the British. For the Jews of Palestine, it was a fight for freedom. Ben-Gurion never authorized terrorism, and he criticized Begin and cohorts for the explosion at the King David. But I think he had to know the impact of terrorism and the fact that it was leading towards the goal he was seeking. Early in 1947, the British conceded defeat. In order that there may be no misunderstanding of the attitude and policy of Britain, I have been instructed by His Majesty's government to announce with all solemnity that they have consequently decided that in the absence of a settlement, they must plan for an early withdrawal of British forces and of the British administration from Palestine. Britain's decision transferred the struggle to the United Nations, where the question of the partition of Palestine and the status of Jerusalem now became the central issue. The Arabs bitterly opposed the plan. Ben-Gurion argued for partition, and intense lobbying went on behind the scenes. It later appeared that Weizmann had secretly played a decisive role in influencing President Truman to recognize Jewish claims. In November 1947, the fateful vote was taken. No. Soviet Union, yes. The United Kingdom, abstain. The United States, yes. The resolution of the Duck Committee for Palestine was adopted by 33 votes, 13 against, 10 abstentions. In Palestine, the Jews danced for joy, but not Ben-Gurion. I could not dance, he said. I knew that we faced war and that in it, we would lose the best of our youth. The Arabs immediately made their feelings known. I wish to put on record that my government does not recognize the validity of this decision they oppose the creation of a Jewish state in Palestine now or at any future time. 
In the struggle against Britain, Ben-Gurion had won. British public opinion will permit no more expenditure of life and treasure. It will acquiesce no longer in the use of British forces and the squandering of British lives to impose a policy in Palestine which one or other of the parties is determined to resist. We have already used force enough in Palestine in the interest of our international obligations. It has brought to my government infinite anxiety and trouble. It has brought down on our heads the execration of the Jews and the bitter resentment of the Arabs. As the British departed, the Jews faced the armies of five Arab states poised to annihilate them. This was our historic hour, Ben-Gurion wrote. If we did not live up to it through fear or weakness of spirit, it might be generations or even centuries before our people were given another historic opportunity. However grave might be the repercussions of the decision to declare our independence, I knew that the future would be infinitely worse for my people if we did not do so. May 14, 1948, the day the British mandate ended, saw the birth of the new state. From Ben-Gurion's proud words, the Jews of Palestine now learned the name of their new country. It was to be the state of Israel. As Ben-Gurion had foreseen, the Arabs immediately attacked with regular military formations. For a time, Israel's situation looked hopeless, but Ben-Gurion knew that in a war of this kind, the will of his people would prove the stronger. They were fighting for their survival. He ordered every settlement to be defended, and above all, that the road to Jerusalem be kept open. Despite the terrible odds against them, the Jews responded to Ben-Gurion's forceful leadership. The fronts were stabilized. The Arab Legion's assault on Jerusalem was halted, leaving the city divided into two armed camps. In places, there was no more than a narrow street between them. As supplies reached his forces, Ben-Gurion was concerned that Israel should occupy as much territory as possible before an international armistice put an end to the war. In this supreme test, the infant state had forged its nationhood. The world saw that a new power had come into being in fulfillment of an age-old dream. In the new Israel, Weizmann was elected the first president, although as prime minister, Ben-Gurion held all the power. The rivalry and the tension between Ben-Gurion and Weizmann was extraordinary. Two great visionary leaders could not have been more different, and when they fought, they fought. I'm a quarrelsome, obstreperous man, Ben-Gurion used to say. His resignation threats and constant personality disputes certainly made him a difficult autocratic colleague. For 15 years, he dominated Israel's politics, but he sought power for one end only, the security of the nation. As Israel's foremost leader, he enjoyed meeting other world figures like Einstein, the famous Jewish scientist. Ben-Gurion was an extraordinary internationalist. Immediately after the establishment of the state, he was out and around the world, in the United States, several European countries, in an effort to expand Israel's influence, and I think also just of his own conviction about the importance of international support for Israel. 
There were figures in public life that Ben-Gurion admired enormously. Churchill was one because of his strength in the war. And de Gaulle was another. These two odd-sized men got along famously. To everyone, Ben-Gurion had the same message. We are rebuilding the ruins of our ancient land. We are building a state which will serve, as I believe, as a model to the peoples of the Middle East by its social and spiritual values, its democratic regime, and its reverence for the dignity of men. But with Nasser's rise to power in Egypt, the enemies of Israel found a new hero. Nasser exploited the plight of Arabs who were the victims of the war with Israel to build up his image as an Arab messiah. Violence escalated as Arab guerrilla raids from the Gaza Strip brought sharp reprisals from Israel. By the autumn of 56, Britain and France had decided that Nasser had to be toppled by military action. In great secrecy, plans were worked out with Israel's leaders to provide a pretext for Anglo-French intervention. Imagine the political courage it took for one man, in effect one man, because it was all so secret, to decide to go ahead and participate in the Suez campaign. The plan called for Israel to launch a preemptive strike against Egypt across the Sinai Peninsula. Ben-Gurion was deeply conscious of the risk he was running if Britain and France should let him down but the speed and audacity of Israel's attacks stunned the world. Despite the modern equipment they had received from the Soviet Union, Nasser's forces turned out to be a paper tiger. Israel's army proved that she was now the dominant power in the Middle East. Ben-Gurion frequently got sick, physically ill, at crucial moments, such as the Suez campaign. Once he'd made that solitary decision, he had to go to bed for nearly two weeks. He got up from his bed at the end of the fighting and went out and saw the results, flying out with Diane and visiting the troops and the positions in the Sinai. The two objectives or benefits from Suez, as far as Israel and Ben-Gurion were concerned, were to clear the Straits of Tehran, which admit Israeli shipping to the Red Sea and beyond and also to bring an end to the terrorism that had been going on in the Gaza Strip. That's what it was all about as far as Israel was concerned. World pressure eventually forced Ben-Gurion to abandon Israel's gains in favor of a United Nations presence which proved incapable of preventing a subsequent repetition of the conflict. But at least Israel's victory had enormously enhanced her standing in the world and with it the prestige of her aging leader. Ben-Gurion never shirked the difficult decision, nor flinched from unorthodox measures. Among his most controversial actions was to accept payments from Germany in reparation for what the Nazis had done to the Jews. The move provoked uproar in Israel. Formal relations with Germany came later, and then, too, passions ran high. Ben-Gurion argued fiercely that Israel needed the reparations to establish her own security. In any case, he said, Israel was now dealing with a new Germany. He established a real rapport with that now. Uh, they were contemporaries in age, and despite what had gone on, reached a meeting of the minds in their conferences, and I think had a mutual respect for each other. For Ben-Gurion, as for all Jews, the trial of Adolf Eichmann was a reminder of the most powerful emotional argument for Israel's existence. Do you admit the first count brought against you? In the spirit of the indictment, not guilty. Eichmann was eventually hanged. 
Defending Eichmann's abduction by Israeli agents, Ben-Gurion wrote to the president of Argentina, this man Eichmann was the person directly responsible for the execution of Hitler's orders for the final solution of the Jewish problem. Six million of our people were murdered in Europe. Never, even in the age-old annals of our martyrdom, has there been such a fiendish atrocity. There is hardly a Jew in the world who does not have a member of his family among the victims of the Nazis. I need not explain to you, Mr. President, what it means for any people on Earth to be the victims of such a satanic murder campaign and what profound scars such an experience must leave in a people's soul. By the time of his death in 1973, Ben-Gurion could perhaps feel that his people were now at last free to build their own future. Looking back on Ben-Gurion's life, it, it seems that he bore out the old adage about each man having only one revolution in it. Ben-Gurion became prime minister at the age of 61. He summoned his strength again in the crucial and difficult moments. But he was largely absorbed with that creation of the state, and once it was on its way, his main gift was in the protégés and people he selected who later became its leaders. In the end, he went down to the desert for 10 years and became, again, a respected voice, even a prophetic voice. After the war in 1967, he talked, as few Israeli leaders did at that point, about the wisdom of giving back territory in exchange for peace. So I think it's safe to say he would have endorsed the peace treaty that his old adversary, Menachem Begin, signed 12 years later between Israel and Egypt.